each other. Okay. Yeah. All right, we're going to start. So, okay, here we go. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this evening's panel discussion. My name is Asuka Hisa. I am the Director of Learning and Engagement here at ICALA. And I don't know how many of you were here this past week. Weekend, last weekend, Lunar New Year, but we had an extraordinary opening for our current exhibition, Scratching at the Moon, co-organized by guest artist, curator, Anna Sue Hoy, and ICLA's Good Works Executive Director and amazing curator, Anne Elgood. Where's Anne? <laughs> Here we go, yay! So, yeah, we had, I don't know, so many people here. At our open house, we hosted uh, a conversation among artists and curators featuring Ann Elgood, Michelle Lopez, Anna Suhoy, John Tane, and Amy Yao. And in addition to learning about the genesis and ur urgency of this exhib exhibition, we also learned of its importance as the first time a group show of Asian American artists uh, was organized and featured in a contemporary art museum in Los Angeles. So to create good historic is very special. To sustain the goodness of it is the work ahead. So tonight we're going to sustain the goodness of it all in a discussion with more exhibition artists and a moderator who has worked with each of them in the past. We have provided these bio sheets for you that are more detailed uh, so that we can um, if you haven't read them already, we, you can read them uh, so we can get to the meat of the matter quickly. Uh, but um, I'm going to do a little bio briefly of each of them, um, a little bit about each of these three Los Angeles-based artists. So we have Patty Chang, an artist and educator who uses performance, video, installation, and narrative forms when considering identity, gender, transnationalism, colonial legacies, the environment, large-scale infrastructural projects, and impacted subjectivities. Vishal, uh, Vishal Judeo works with video, performance, and installation to construct experimental narratives. His work considers the relational and psychical processes of image making, often blurring fiction and document. Mil John Ruperto is an artist interested in developing approaches to interrogating and expanding our, our conception of nature and history. And our moderator is Anuradha Vikram, a writer, curator, and educator. And there's so much more about Anu, but it's all in the bio sheet. Um, we're going to... Uh, going to point to the titles of their work. We have some stills from the works that uh, they have done. And a bit of housekeeping, I'd like to announce that we will have a catalog for Scratching at the Moon releasing in the spring, April, hopefully, with incredible essays by Chris Kurumitsu, John Tain, and Sarah Wang, in addition to the curators. And on our bookshelf, uh, we have the bookshelf residency with Uga Booga, and Wendy Yao is here. Uga Booga is a beloved bookshop and concept store in Los Angeles, where uh, during their residency, you'll find uh, books about or by artists in the show. And we just received the recent releases from ex-artists books, um, Anu Vikram's Use Me at Your Own Risk, Visions from the Darkest Timeline, and Miljan Ruperto's interactive publication, an operational account of Western spatial temporality. So those are on the shelves and available. Um, we have a season of fantastic programs. Uh, join our mailing list for our great newsletters. They are great. And, our, and follow us on social media if you do that. Programs are supported by ICLA's awesome Fieldwork Council. And you are all supporting us by showing up to tonight's event. It's Valentine's Day. We love you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to give it to Anu, who will kick it off. Great. Thank you so much, Asuka. Let's hear it for the <coughs> local legend, Asuka Hisa. <laughs> Many thanks to you. Thanks to Anne for having us today. Um, it's really pleased to be part of this. And 
honored to be here with this esteemed artist panel. Oscar mentioned that I've worked with all these artists, but she didn't mention that it has been the highlight of my career to work with these three artists, but it truly has. <laughs> They're some of my favorite artists and some of my very favorite people, and also some of the people that I've been fortunate to call colleagues in the last few years while I've been teaching. So um, basically, this is my community, and I'm really glad to be here with you all. So welcome. Um, we have so many things to talk about. I don't know where we're gonna go with all of this. I feel like we could talk about literally everything. But I try to keep it contained because I think we have about 50 minutes, is that right? Okay, so we'll see how many of these questions we get through. I did have the great privilege of watching these two films back to back as part of my preparation for this evening. And I have to say that they make a really wonderful lyrical pair. So I will also be framing my questions in the context of thinking about these two works individually but also in terms of how they represent also a community that we're part of. And I'll talk a little bit about how that is. So let me just briefly introduce by saying, um, in order of when I work with them, Miljan was the first, Vishal was the second, and Patty was the third. Miljan was one of the first artists that I met with when I arrived in Los <coughs> Angeles. Um, and Patty was actually the last artist that I worked with at 18th Street Art Center, which is where I was able to host all three of these wonderful artists for residencies and New York commissions. And then I was really pleased to be able to see the work that they made in residency carry over into future works for quite a bit of time, including this work that Patty has in the show, which is directly related to the exhibition that we did in, was it 2020 now or was it 2020? 2020. It was 2020, um, which was called Milk Debt. So, it's always a real pleasure and treat to see work that you've done carry forward into newer and bigger forums. And so I love watching just your, each of you expand radically. Um, and then I also had the great pleasure of working on the edition with Miljohn in the early stages. So I was one of the editors of the X Topics series with uh, Ana Iwataki, who's a wonderful Asian American curator, Japanese American curator here in LA. Um, and then Miljohn came up with this incredible idea that blew all our minds and it's even more beautiful now. So I really encourage you to take a look at it. And then somehow I managed to become an author for our book series anyway, um, even though I was really only supposed to be an editor. So then we put out my book as well. Um, so again, many thanks to X Artist Books too. Okay, that's enough with the thank yous and the gushing. I'm, I promised I wouldn't gush too much, but I do really love all these people very much. So, okay, first question. Um, okay, so it strikes me that uh, we are all artists. I think I can safely say we're all artists in our 40s. Yeah? No, I'm, I'm older than everyone on this panel, obviously. No way. I'm 52. My birthday was last week. So we oh, yeah, happy birthday, Patty. A pioneer in more ways than one. Are you 52? <laughs> okay, our 40s and 50s. I'm the baby. You are. <laughs> we knew that. So, I can't speak for everybody, but certainly when I was a young person and a young artist in my early 20s, there were very few Asian American artists to look to. Um, and there were, while there were individuals um, in the art history books, there was no community to recognize. The communities were just sort of emerging at that time. So I think one of the things I noticed when I look back on the last 20 years in the art world is that the conversation in many ways has caught up to where we are and we've kind of had to tread water in a certain way in order to get to a point where we're actually understood and visible and perceived. So I want to ask about that first. What has the expansion of the global art and biennial culture meant for your reception as artists from the AAPI diaspora? Do you feel like it's had an effect or an impact over the last, let's say, 10, 15 years? Um, oh, um, <laughs> I, I think so. You know, um, it's, it's funny to, to show a work internationally versus showing a work um, here in the States, you know, because they're always contextualized, of course, in, in, in sort of different social political context. And I think, um, yeah, I think in, in the States, you kind of have to build more avenues into the work or to the discourse. Um, 
but you know, if I show in Southeast Asia, it's 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 yeah, it's it's less. Well, I still have to build approaches, but the yeah. approaches would be more, um, you know, uh, more philosophical. You know, like Western philosophy, that kind of uh, inroads. Yeah. So like different scaffolding depending yeah. on where you're showing. Yeah. I mean it's it's most I mean the work stays the same except the 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 context that you build around the work in different venues. And are there more opportunities to show now internationally than before, do you think? Yeah, I think so with globalization. I think um, and sort of this this investment, like a cultural investment in different countries, I think yeah, there's more and more opportunities to, to show, just generally, yeah. yeah. What about making work? You've made work in different countries. You know, what's that been like for you versus working here in the States? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, 12 years ago was the first time that I made a work in India. And, um, you know, that was an interesting decision because I think that there was, in certain ways, I think I was toying in part with like identity and how I was perceived, right? Because, you know, um, I think what's important, you know, is that I'm of the Asian diaspora, sure, but it's, it's rooted through the Caribbean. And I think like, because my family is, you know, my family's of Indian descent from Guyana. And I think when I made that first decision, which was in Made in LA, the first Made in LA in 2012, um, I just, I was exploring certain things working in Los Angeles that actually I wouldn't say were necessarily tied in any way to, to a kind of, not to an ethnic identity. They were tied to my queerness for sure and my, my sense of, of, you know, being a person of color uh, for sure. But I don't think that there was a, a, a tie in at all to my ethnic identity. Um, and but when I made the choice to make a work in India, it was, it wasn't actually about some kind of like wishing to go to a homeland. In a sense, it was actually more about thinking about what would, like, what would happen if I took some of the questions that I was asking, that at that point the work was actually very much around thinking through aspects of, you know, American vernacular culture actually. Like it was those early investigations were thinking through television, right? And like thinking about public American culture. And I think I asked the question of, to myself of like what it would mean to take that to another place. And I think I chose India partly because I knew that it was a place that I could feel a degree of both intimacy and distance from. And that work really played on that, right? Like, and it was interesting because at the time, I mean, it was like, this was, it was a piece called Goods Carrier and some of y'all might have seen it. Um, in that first made in LA. And I think, I, I, I don't want to give too long an answer here because I think what's really interesting is that that made in LA was not, that was before the art world was specifically diversifying in a particular way. And it is, was such a diverse made in LA, but we weren't necessarily categorized accordingly, right? In a very actually interesting way. I thought, you know, when I think about the, the how diverse that roster of artists was, it was it was such a reflection of who was working in Los Angeles. But, you know, there were, you know, if there were multiple South Asian artists, for example, in the exhibition, we weren't positioned in relation to each other. We were able to be artists, right? And um, and so I kind of made this choice to go and work in. India and make this work that was about export. It was about import and export. It was called goods carrier. It was about like going to a foreign place and importing something, right? And it was made so consciously thinking through that kind of tension. But it was interesting because of the projections that came for it. Like I remember a few people said to me, that's so cool that you went to make work with your family. But these were cast actors in a house in Bombay. Like, you know, it was like, it had nothing to do with, like, it was just, and, and that was a really interesting question. And I was playing with it. I was toying with it. It looked like a familial structure. It looked like these things, and I, I was aware of that, you know? 
And so, sorry, you asked me a question and I went over there, but no, so like in a way, but I think that my relationship to working in these other parts of the world has been a little around that, right? More recently, I've been working in Guyana and that is much more rooted in like ancestry. Um, and that's this whole other, like as a 42 year old for the first time, or I'm 44, but when I first started this project in Guyana, that's the first time that I've actually been investigating a lineage. Just even though you didn't ask that, but that is no, a little that bit that of, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You know where I'm going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the first time, I mean, I think yeah. that's interesting what you said about your choice in that first, or the made in LA to go to India. Because the first time that I worked, I, I would say outside of my studio, mm -hmm. outside of the US, was outside of the US, and um, I had gotten some money, and I decided that I would go to China. Mm -hmm. And the place that I wanted to visit was the town that they renamed Shangri-La. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, Shangri-La comes from this uh, British colonial novel, like imagining what the Orient is mm -hmm. and thinking about the sort of, you know, colonial story. Um, and, uh, and so I was interested in actually visiting that as a space um, that is disconnected from me, but I think has a relationship to my understanding also of a, maybe a type of identity because of, um, you know, like mythology, thinking about mythology, thinking about like being not from China, you know, but from the US. So this relationship of distance mm -hmm. and familiarity, like you're exactly mm -hmm. talking about, um, that I was also investigating, but in a very sort of, you know, not familial way, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and it strikes me that in both of those works that you cited, your early works, that um, there is a real tension between like evidence and truth telling and absolute fiction, um, which I think also speaks in some way to the way that we're expected to perform that identity, which is that people assume that there's an authenticity that we may not feel. So this came up in our kind of pre-conversation, um, and I'm going to come back to it, but I just want to kind of put that there. The next question that I have, or the next few questions that I have are actually about the work that's in this exhibition that's shown, stills are shown here from Vishal and Miljan's collaborative work called Cutline, which is a brand new work for the, made for the show. And then Patty's work, We Are All Mothers, uh, which was made after the Muktet show that we did. So regarding the work that you have in the show and your process of making it, I'm going to start by asking Vish and Miljan, how did you approach creating this work together based on material that Michelle had previously shot, some of which was used in the work that you showed at Commonwealth earlier? Was it earlier this year? Or this November. Year? Yeah, oh, November, last okay, year. last year. Um, and how did you ensure that, or how do you ensure that all of the voices in a collaboration are evenly balanced? I just give them really long answers. <laughs> I think it's your turn. Well, tell us how you got roped into this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. I, know, I, know. I mean, um, I think, again, I think we were, um, yes, it was research that I was doing that was very sort of linked to a set of investigations. And I think when Miljan and I started talking, we were actually talking about the idea of a landscape, of a place, and of what it would what it would mean to kind of approach that through this kind of speculative imagery right like game engine design and like literally one of my favorite things about miljan is i was like well where should it be and he was like i don't care <laughs> and i think you literally said those words and it that meant so much to me because it was sort of like it was like it was like he the way that miljan was thinking through this question of landscape that the work really questions the specificity didn't really matter, right? Like it, like we had a sense of the type of place we wanted, right? And then when I kind of made the suggestion, I was like, why don't we, because I was already doing this research around this kind of rural area um, where, you know, my dad's side of the family kind of eventually settled, right? As like, as agricultural workers um, after serving, um, as indentured laborers in, in, on plantations, you know, following the abolition of slavery in the British Empire of, uh, uh, in Guyana. Um, you know, I was sort of like, well, it's a really charged locale, but it is also just like jungle. It's kind of like a little bit, it's like, you know, edge of jungle. It's like, there's some, there's a little bit of a kind of, it could be many places in the world, but it has a specific charge to me. So what if we 
use that as the site where we're doing this I don't care landscape thing, right? Like, what if we played with that tension? Um, and, and so then in terms of the co collaboration, it wasn't the work, I wouldn't say necessarily, it became more about that, about that research, but that was just a starting point. And then in terms of the collaboration of this question of like, of, of a sort of shared labor or a shared sense of even investment, because that would be the main question, yeah. I think that's <clears throat> when it became really interesting was having, was that right until the end, Meljan would say like, the, an interesting thing is like, why does this matter to me? Yeah. Right. And um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of our conversations revolved around um, approach, yeah. approach to material and um, what type of responsibility do you feel in approaching material? You know, especially if it's uh, if it's connected to you somehow, or or even the whole um, issues that come up with in representing. A, a place, you know, and sort of one of my favorite characters is the anxious historian, you know, and because I, I feel like, you know, there, there's a, there a project of history, but there's also, uh, you're, you're also overwhelmed by this uh, particular type of responsibility, you know, um, yeah, and I think these discussions that we we had, um, yeah, you know, I saw Vicious uh, two last films, you know, and I always, I, I really loved both of them. I thought they were really great. And um, what I liked most about them was how the way I see them was through this, this dance that Vish does in terms of implication, you know, with, with with the people that he's he's uh, uh, engaging with, and sort of showing a kind of entanglement, you know, um, and the recent film, uh, Vish also depicted a kind of pushback from the place itself, you know, and I thought that was really fantastic, and so that's where sort of a lot of our conversations, um, you know, because I'm I'm also interested in those things and. You know, we share the same, uh, yeah, uh, interest, or maybe anxiety or something. Yeah. Compulsion. Compulsion. Yeah. So, Patty, you also built your work from an archive of footage that was generated in part by research for previous work or a larger body of work. Um, this I know that the, the imagery is mostly new, but there's yeah. some there's some bleed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, definitely. I think. <clears throat> really, the question is about research and how you make a body of work from a body of research. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that if you haven't seen the piece, I spent like since middle of pandemic um, collaborating online very closely with um, Estrida Nemangas, who is a feminist ecological scholar, and her sister, Alexia Nemangas who's a wildlife pathologist, and she does necropsies on harbor porpoises, necropsies when you like cut them open to find out why they died. And um, so we started this online, you know, uh, collaboration meeting every week, um, learning about, you know, everybody's language because they're not artists and I'm not a scientist. Um, and then through that process, <clears throat> I learned that science is actually based on ritual. They just have another word, they use protocols. So that was sort of my entry point into like thinking about how we might have a meeting point in these disciplines. And so I, um, I asked if she would be willing to um, include an extra ritual in her practice, um, which was to take a minute to be with the animal before doing the necropsy touching the animal, thinking about it, um, and then taking a picture um, for me, mainly because it was COVID and I couldn't be there. So that's how it originally started. And um, so we did this for months and months. It's been like three years that we've been kind of working together. And, um, and we were sort of building this archive or just really having this relation. And, um, 
And the piece that I have in the show is really um, my reflections on this process and actually on the very first necropsy that we witnessed because we would watch them in the middle of the night online. And, um, and so the piece, the text is really written about that first necropsy. Um, and the, the crux of it is the important part that links to my former work, which we worked on together, was that she cuts open the stomach and she finds breast milk. And it shocked me that there was breast milk in this thing that looked like a fish. I knew, you know, like logically that it was a mammal. But even just like hearing that her say that and then seeing it when she showed it to me was so shocking. And so I reflected on that because of the, the previous project that Anu and I worked on that was about um, breast pumping and also about kind of affective feelings and relations and how they kind of like come out of the body. And so, um, so the piece is sort of about entangling all of these things. So it's thinking about this process of someone else, thinking about interspecies relation, and you know, building this kind of research that is building this research, and then also thinking about the emotional lives of people that don't deal with emotion, I guess. Um, and those are, you know, so sort of working in all these ways and thinking about what research is. So as a follow-up, um, well, first I just want to point out that thinking about it, this idea of the touch archive or the, the protocol or the, the honoring of the deceased sea mammal through touch goes back much longer than that in your work. It goes all the way back to the whale. Right, that yeah. Which is also I showed here at ICA, <laughs> which was also a work that Patty was working on and right. showed in yeah, progress right, right. in an artist talk at UC Berkeley back in 2009 that's or 10 right. when I was working there, which is when we first met, that's yes. how I met Michelle. So um, we, yeah, I mean, it's just interesting to me how this comes back, right? That there's just, yeah. there's certain things that you're concerned with all the way through. And part of that I think is about like humanizing our relationship to these other creatures in a way so that it's less detached and scientific and more affective and emotional. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, you're very I, ahead of your time in that way. Actually. I think that you know, there's some relationship, and and Mil John, you were saying when we were having our you know our Zoom, like thinking about nature. I mean, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's a really also a very big presence in your work and this particular work too as a collaboration, like thinking about the river and the flow of water and the relationship of the human characters who are speaking and acting. But, you know, everything is tied to, you know, like traversing this thing larger than themselves. Yeah, I, I like thinking about the question of nature because it's, 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 it's an infinite ground in a way. And so what happens is when you ask someone uh, what they think nature is, it really presents the base the shape of their ontology, you know, or their cultural um, upbringing also, you know, like all that stuff come into play in, you know, in their attitudes towards a tree or animals and, and so on, you know? And I think, um, yeah, I, so for me, looking at the, at the, at the work, at your work, um, I kept thinking really about how I was thinking about embodiment and how um, being in a place and being in nature, you know, like what, what does that mean? And what are the, yeah, what are the different uh, filters that you have on when, when you approach nature, you know? And, and it's nice to see this, this kind of um, this attempt at care, but through multiple registers, you know, there's a, yeah, there's this, this scientific protocol, you know, um, and cultural protocols and all these other uh, mechanisms, you know, that, that, that separates you. And I think that's, that's what one of the things that we talked about also, um, where, in, in this case, we, we, uh, we wanted to put 
that line, you know, where we wanted to make a place where the place is a placeholder. Mm -hmm. You know, we're thinking a lot about simulation. What, what, what is that, you know? And what do we think, um, you know, like this, this virtual space could also be a space where things can happen. It could be expansive as nature, you know? It just depends on the, the approach. And, you know, and you could also use this as, as a filter, you know, um, that informs how you approach the world, you know? And in this case, it becomes more of a, a shield protecting the different parties. Are you talking specifically about the river being um, a CGI, like a, the Unreal Engine space? Yeah, we, we really wanted to make a, a space in suspension, you know, where it's not Guiana, you know? It's, mm -hmm. It looks like a jungle, you know? It looks like it's in the tropics, you know? But it's just an, it's just an image. Also, and I guess we we had these uh, ambitious <laughs> dreams of what can happen in this space where things are in suspension. You know, where our responsibility to the to the place is defined by the approach. You know, and not you don't have to uh, commit. You know, or. Um, yeah, we like this this place where we're at the threshold of, of a place and we're, you know, we're presenting this threshold, you know, before we enter into it, you know? And and so I feel like the, the work itself expands horizontally outward and it never goes into the landscape. So the landscape is always there perpetually moving, but it's, it's it keeps things in, in suspension, even though it looks like it's in, I mean, it is in flux. So this question came up and I think I've been struggling with it because the very word nature is such a fraught word, you know, and I think about it in a few different ways that I think we can maybe unpack a little bit here. One is, right, this idea that nature itself is a construct because it's a way in which we as human beings are separated from the landscape and acculturated to imagine ourselves not as part of the animal kingdom or part of the ecosystem. Um, it also comes up in the sense that with the current discourse of identity and specifically ethnic identity in contemporary art, there's often an assumption at play that's unspoken that identity is somehow natural, that we'll have certain interests, certain concerns because naturally because of our identity. And one of the things that came up in our conversation about diaspora experience is that very often those things aren't natural to us at all. What is expected of us to be performed as our authentic identity is actually utterly performance, fabrication, very often. And often we're fabricating in order to be accepted because we're in between cultures in this way. And then the other thing I was thinking about is Haran Faraki has a film, I forget, I think it's Variations 4, where he's looking at unreal and environments like this parallel. in video game. Parallel. parallel. That's a parallel, right? <clears throat> parallel four. So he's talking about the image of a jungle in a traditional film, a shot on location. He's saying, you know, there's the wind in the trees that the, the director wanted and that the, you know, they made happen with fans and what have you. And then there's the wind in the trees because there's wind in the trees, because you're in the landscape and things are happening. But in the Unreal Engine, there's no natural wind. There's only stage wind or artificial wind. So I think about this sort of expectation of nature, like there's a lushness in that river that's almost too lush in a way, you know, or the way that um, a lot of times when you're filming Guiana, there's almost like a screen of trees or sort of a like an impenetrable forest. It makes you think a lot about like Wilfredo Lam painting Cuba, you know, the same kind of like everything's very like, sorry, like stage front sort of, and we don't really know what goes on behind the scenes. So I'm thinking about this idea of nature in terms of like 
also like the diaspora experience of nature versus nurture, like what part of this is what I'm born to, what part of this is what I'm being acculturated into, even expectations about being model minority come from certain expectations of like, what is our nature? Our nature is to efface ourselves in order to fit more seamlessly into the dominant culture. And if that's not your nature, or that's not even your ethnicity's nature, you often get excised. So one of the things that South Asians experience, for example, especially in California, is that we're not really even considered Asian. So we have one South Asian in this show and via Guyana, we don't have any West Asians. You know, there's no Armenians, there's no Iranians. Those people are all Asian too. So it's interesting how it basically defaults to whatever people are sort of used to, but that's taken as natural. So I just wanted to bring up this kind of question of natural because I don't think there's anything really natural about us, actually. You know? <laughs> so what are your thoughts about that? I well, I had one thought actually just I, oh, like I like some of these kind of ponderings about kind of nature and relationships to diaspora and like they're just a kind of anecdote is like the first time because in the catalog which you all will see there's a conversation um, that Mil John and I have with Michelle Lopez and so and I remember for the conversation I had sort of just cut together some imagery um, you know from my archive of footage and we started, I started playing it and Michelle was like, oh, that looks like the Philippines. And it was like, and we kind of laughed. We were like, yeah, in a certain way, it could be so many colonized places. Mm -hmm. Like it, it is just this, this edge of a jungle and we all might, like any, anybody that sort of recognizes that type of space might be like, yeah, that, I, I recognize that. And it's also that particular imagery was like super eight footage that my dad shot, right? So it, like, how does it look? It's just sort of like someone sort of attempting to understand a place, right, that they feel distant from. And um, and I think that that kind of question seemed really interesting to me. Also, just thinking about, like, you know, colonized lands, like the idea that it's actually the land, the land that, that takes the colonizer there, and then the colonizer then brings all the cheap labor or free labor, right? you know, enslaved labor or otherwise um, to kind of extract from that land. And so so the movement of people is always following the kind of the the gold of the land. Right. And so um, so I had those thoughts. And then and just as you were talking, like I was also thinking about the way that when when I first went to Guyana, like as an adult, like 10, uh, 12 years ago or something, I was really thinking I was struck by this idea of these like farmers from India, like my ancestors, and then entering this kind of like, like Amazon, like jungle and like the alienness of that space. And, and then I was really struck, like the, there's a story in this film from an uncle that talks about being lost in the jungle. And I was really struck by this thought that, oh, he comes to understand the jungle in this really kind of like native way. And then what was really interesting was that the historian was like, no, he actually is so clearly from this story, not someone that spends very much time in the jungle. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, right, there's always this pushback. There's always this, right? It's, it's sort of like the way that nature or landscape kind of functions in this colonial story right. is always going to be one of a kind of rejection in a sort of a way, right? And yeah. So, well, it's also, know, it's so, yeah. constructed in this fake landscape because the plantation itself, we're led to believe in so many ways that it is a version of nature or agriculture. But, you know, CLR James points out that in fact, it is very much industry it's production, it's modernism, right? It's import, export. It's, it really is almost Fortean in, yeah. its, in its relationship to, to organized labor or the organization of labor. And it's not a jungle at all. Yeah. 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 Farming's not natural. <laughs> Nothing about farms are natural. <laughs> um, I wanted to just pick up on the yeah. other part of your question which was somehow rooted in diaspora and identity. Mm -hmm. Because when we were on Zoom, and you had started off talking about the sort of ambivalence of being included in a group, and you had this, I thought, interesting phrase of saying about AAPI, like opting in. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then, you, you know, and then when you asked me to talk about it, I, I brought up that text that I had quoted in the time that I was talking about this particular work in terms of identity. And, um, and um, 
I start with thinking about um, Alexis Pauline Gum's Undrowned, um, which is her book about uh, marine mammals and identifying through marine mammals, thinking about marine mammals. Um, and she uses the phrase, um, I identify as mammal. I identify as a mammal. And, and that's the first line. Um, and then the second one, she talks about, I identify mm -hmm. as a black woman, um, you know, and how she learns from, you know, her, her um, group. And then the third one is just about, you know, loving, you know, marine mammals. And, um, but I was thinking about this idea of opting in about like thinking about inclusion on different levels or like, you know, like thinking about being included in the mammal kingdom is very wide in terms of scale. And then, and then thinking about like being an Asian American um, is, you know, a more narrow sort of um, uh, subcategory, subcategory, yes. or you yeah. know, or um, yeah, something I would maybe opt into as yeah. you know, as multiple. And so the relation between these larger groups that we identify with or we you know feel kinship with, in relation to the smaller ones, it feels like there's a, a, necess a necessity to have all of those you know, working in relation. And the other thing I also um, like about what she talks about in terms of like thinking of science and identity is that, you know, scientists um, identify um, species, you know, you, you identify each species um, uh, and, and you, that's how you recognize it from the outside. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other way to think of identifying is like, I identify, you know, yeah. with, someone else or something else. So it's also an internal, like feel, collective feeling too. So I think of, about all of those different, you know, ways of, of thinking about, you know, group and dispersion and scale. Well, when you said that, when you quoted Alexis Pauline Gums and that I was watching the film again, after you had said that, and I was thinking about Alexis Pauline Gums, but I was also thinking about Christina Sharp because she says in the wake, um, in the book, In the Wake, she says, something about how the mother whale in the condition of climate change is alike with the black mother birthing a black child into a condition of oppression, incarceration, and black death. And that the act of birthing under these circumstances is simultaneously a joy and a mourning, that it's a birthing and also a, a pre premonition of death. And of course, that sensibility is so strong in this film and has been haunting me, um, especially with all of the images coming out of Rafa this week. It's been almost more than my brain can take, honestly. But um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your identification with mammals, maybe in a less cushy, friendly way. <laughs> and some of the, you know, maybe some of the things about um, motherhood and climate that have come up over the years while we've been working together and why we care so deeply. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, some, some part of like thinking about motherhood and climate, you know, makes me think in catastrophic terms. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's one. Um, and so it's, it's always these very extreme scenarios, um, which come out of love, <laughs> which is weird. Um, but I also think that, you know, there's something about, uh, like thinking about motherhood, which, you know, like, like one of the terms I learned and it's in the video that I learned from the theorist, uh, was thinking reparatively and how what we were doing was something that was reparative. I didn't understand that in terms of thinking in a thinking like with a paranoid reading, I, I guess this comes from Eve Sedgwick. But I was thinking about how, um, you know, these, this, the idea of facts and, you know, the sort of like the doom of my catastrophic thinking is sort of within this, could be considered within this category of the paranoid. But then taking that and then doing something with it perhaps is a way to think of it, it as being reparative, as a reparative reading. And that actually makes me think of a line in your video, which you say, um, because I think going from paranoid to reparative then leads to the regenerative. And there's that line that you say, we, wanna, we need to think about the regenerative, the extractive, and the exhausted. 
And I thought that was such a great line and really, you know, resonated with me in terms of my work and project in this, that's in the show as well. I mean, perhaps, we, you know, you could talk a little bit about that, too. Well, that was a question that I had, too. So Miljun asked, what's generative? What's extractive? What's exhausted? But you didn't answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's that's what I was, you know, when that recording, I was just reminding Fish Right? I was just reminding you that, oh yeah, we have to keep these in mind because this is what we've been thinking about, you know? Um, like how, one of the, one of the yeah. funny things we were thinking about was really, um, how is something exhausted, you know? Um, like what, you know, like what's in a place that can be exhausted? Sure, you know, like it's, you, but in terms of its objectness or thing in the world, it's like, you know, there's something in nature that you, you know, like it's, inex it's inexhaustible, you know? Um, and so we were thinking about this, this, this idea also that something that's inexhaustible, but we're, but we're both so, uh, um, you know, our conversations with Vikram also, it's, it's always about uh, the responsibility of uh, not being extractive, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so, but the place is, you know, the, the way we imagine a place also, right? Like what, what, what's inherent in a place that's, that could be exhausted or not exhausted like it's always both you know it, it, yeah yeah no i mean i was just gonna say i mean like i think part of the like you know this historian's anxiety that that the work is very much about because the voice of you know vikram tamboli who's brilliant historian and one of the few contemporary historians that's dedicated their research to guyana right like this is a place that does not figure very much in the popular imagination but, you know, and is at this kind of, like, it's about to be exhausted. Like, it's like, you know, 2015, like, ExxonMobil found one of the largest deposits of oil. Um, you know, Guyana has granted ExxonMobil 98% profit from that. You know, there continues to be extraction of, of all the other natural resources in the place. Um, as you all would have heard in the news, like, you know, like Venezuela tried to just annex a big chunk of, you know, so it's like this place that's just under threat in so many ways. And this question of when will something be exhausted, right, is so is so present. And then also it's, you know, where like 90% of the country's population lives is on the shoreline, which is effectively under sea level because when the Dutch came, they built a seawall so that they could more easily cultivate the, the sort of coastal land because the Amazon was so dense, they couldn't do it cost effectively, right? And so all of that's threatened. So like this idea of this kind of exhaustion or like this kind of like coming up against an end was just sort of like hovering over all of this. And I think part of the, this, his, for example, historian's anxiety is around wanting to properly historically represent a place that has not been properly represented in the historical archive necessarily and then also is at its tail, like it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's facing such, you know, existential and material threats in terms of it's just being there. And so he's like, everything has to be gotten right, right? As we represent these stories, you know, and uh, as also we, the, yeah. Also the discipline itself yeah. also ha is having an existential panic. The discipline meaning history? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah because yeah. I mean, a lot of yeah. this comes back to, I think something in Patty's work too, where the archives of the diasporic experience, particularly the kind of experience that Vishal describes of the Asian, mostly Indian and Chinese laborers who were replacements for the African enslaved people who could no longer be enslaved and transported under British law, uh, but could still be enslaved if they had already been taken and enslaved. Um, that to be these kind of replacement workers, to be brought into communities that have already had their populations replaced once 
in the sense that the majority population is now of African descent rather than indigenous descent. And then, you know, our communities mix in and they also sort of disappear into. So, for example, you know, many people don't realize that Wilfredo Lam was also part Chinese. We always think of him as an Afro-Cuban. But, you know, Asians are pervasive within the Caribbean as well, um, so much so that we, again, we become naturalized in a certain way. Um, we're going to probably run out of time kind of soon, right? So I should hustle a little bit. What do you think, Oscar? How long do we have? Okay. So the, the question I wanted to ask was about, at one point in Cutline, I don't remember who it is that says, but you say something about a manhood story. And then there's this wonderful moment at the end where you sort of point out, this is what I was getting at, is like, in the archive, only certain stories appear. And the stories are usually the stories of the colonizer, of the victor. But if they're the stories of the laborer, they're the ship manifest, they're you know, the labor roles, they're criminal records, and usually the people represented in those are men. And you almost never have representation of the women at all. So there's an awareness that like part of the story is missing in the film for that reason. And that's why it was so complimentary to watch the two films together. Because when I put them together, I felt like we had the manhood story and we had the mother story. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what those are because both the manhood story and the mother story are characterized by labor and by violence. But the character of that labor and the character of that violence is different. So in the manhood story, the labor is the labor of the tool, the labor of exploitation, but also like you say, the labor of risk and speculation, like the get rich quick kind of scheme. Whereas in the motherhood story, the labor is the labor of labor. It's the labor of care, it's the labor of reproduction, and it's the labor of maintenance. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of put that out there and ask a little bit about gender and violence and climate and the violence is enacted on the body that you touch on in your work. Um, wow, that's huge. But I love the connection, <laughs> that's so beautiful. Um, I guess, there's so much to say, but I guess the one thing I was thinking about in terms of labor and the piece that I have in the show is um, that it kind of became clear as we were working on the collaboration that the labor that was missing for the scientist was emotional labor. Mm -hmm. Like the labor they carry that they deny when they go into their place of work which is you know, that they went into this, this field because they loved something mm -hmm. so much, you know, that they wanted to dedicate their entire lives to study it. And what's happening with climate change and you know, everything is that a lot of these scientists are actually tracking the demise and possible extinction of some of these beloved creatures. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like a lot of it was thinking about what, you know, where where they where that where that emotional labor goes and you know and what it means to compartmentalize you know who you are with what you do and and how that's a violence a very painful violence i think and i think that's part of the pro the, the problematic of science obviously is to like bifurcate that like your existence um, and i think that that is related for me like thinking about you know, this relationship, I'm gonna just talk about yeah, your piece yeah. now. This relationship to nature in the work where it's like, it's the adversary, you know? It's like the thing that you're against, like the story of walking through and, you know, the walking, trying to make your way back and like extracting. But it's like, that's like the thing that you have to get over, you know? It's, it's actually the, you know, the ecosystem, the nature, the thing that you're part of. So it's actually yourself, right? Sorry, I didn't mean to jump on your piece, no, 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 but it just made us thinking about it, you know, the connection. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and it, it's the, like the opening of the other film that I made in Guyana this, you know, in the last few months um, that was at Commonwealth and Council called Deo's Moon. It opens with this question of like how me as a gay boy, like trying to figure my way out in this place where this kind of masculine energy is so heavy, right? And um, so I think some of the kind of masculinity questions that come out here, they're linked to that, 
not kind of on purpose. They just sort of emerged through making it, you know? I mean, I think um, part of it was because of the voices. It was like, you know, working with the, this historian, right, who's another dude. So it was like three dudes sitting around trying to, <laughs> trying to figure out a piece, you know? And I re I'm like, but, and then also speculating around the dudes that, that were in this place, right? So like at a certain point, it became very clear that it was like, oh man, like what's going on here? But you know, when I was in in Guyana, part of, so in there they appear in my um, in the other film that I made, you know, that that was at Commonwealth and Council, are these two queer cousins, right? Who who traveled with me at one point last year, and they just kept being like, oh my god, it's like the women's stories in this place are totally abstracted, right? Like they're just they're they're unavailable, and you know, m one of my one of my cousins is an archivist. She's studying to be an archivist, um, and you know, there's this book which anybody uh, uh, would be really interested in. It's called Coolie Woman by uh, Gaitra Bahadur. Um, and it's this amazing story of the sort of women uh, of indenture, right? And it's it's almost sort of working in a sense like Cydia Hartman's kind of like... Um, like a speculative sort of, kind yeah, of... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. yeah. Um, because it's sort of like working with, a, with an incomplete archive and trying to pr produce stories out of that, right? Um, and, um, so that, that just became kind of, that's become clear as I've done this research, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and so that's why like in the film, like, you know, the final, the final question is me saying, but who are the women? As I'm talking to my parents and they're describing more of the men in the line, right? But it's also partly the way that records are kept, right? It was like the way that, the way that, you know, female subjects were were sort of documented in the archives as they left India, right? They were, they were, you know, categorized with their husband or with, the, you know, so, so it was this kind of like, um, any form of sort of like trying to kind of retrace the steps, it, you're just looking down the men's line, right? And I think, and I realized how much that had been internalized even by both of my parents where my mom's like, wait, what are you asking? And I was like, no, the women, who are the women? Like, you know, um, and I think it, it just when I heard that it made a lot of sense as a way to sort of end the work, but also to open up the possibility because this is potentially an episodic work, right? Like Caribbean televisions where I was just kind of like, yeah, I've got to, I've got to investigate these other stories or, or try my best to work with folks that, that want to investigate these stories. So, yeah. And you do seem to always set yourself up with a question at the end of your work that leads you into the next one somehow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems productive. The trailer. A stinger. Yeah. So, what does it mean to consider this work in relation to diaspora? One of the things that came up when we were preparing is this idea, which I kind of touched on before, but I want to come back to this idea that we're always speaking from a place that we don't actually inhabit, in a sense. That, and what came up as we were talking about this in this pre-meeting was that, in fact, the landscape, because we have no connection to the land, having been not born of that soil, but the landscape is actually in our embodiment because that's where our identification with this other place is always so evident. So can you talk a little bit about that experience of like understanding the nation as your body or your body as a landscape or trying to situate yourself in this nebulous concept of diaspora I have a good answer. Um, I just have one small thing to say, yeah. really, and I think I mentioned it when we were talking, is that um, through working on this project with scientists, I I learned that um, you know our bodies or any bodies are the best way to preserve anything. Mm -hmm. Like you know, right? You talk you talk we, about this. Yeah. Uh, intake of toxins and then the dumping yeah. of the toxins. Everything is in the body. Everything is there. You know, there's memory of everything in it. Um, and s stuff breaks down slowly if it's intact mm -hmm. within. And so I think of that in a sense as, you know, the container. Like, it's literally the best mode of preservation. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think that it can be, you know, expanded on thinking in different ways, but... You know, just on a very literal level. Yeah. I mean, we, we think about the work 
as a container. So, and uh, what we were doing is to fashion, fashion this container. Should we open it to the questions from the audience, you think? All right, well, uh, we welcome you to participate in this conversation. <laughs> we'll give you a minute to let it all filter in. Very rich conversation. Mashinka, I knew I could count on you. <laughs> Yet another one of our fabulous X Topics authors, by the way, Mashinka Franco Kopian. Thank you so much for this, this really incredibly rich and robust conversation. Um, I feel like it's the kind of conversation that leaves you with a thousand questions. Uh, I was really drawn, Anu, to what you were saying about the relationship between like nature and the naturalization of certain kinds of experience and denaturalization of others. And uh, I think what I wanna ask is just sort of another reframing of the question that you already asked, which is, what does it mean to enter into this discursive field where certain forms of Asian identity and diasporic identity are naturalized and, the, and others are not, and to bear the burden of representation within that field, but also bear the burden of, having, of trying to denaturalize what these kind of ossified cultural meanings are within that space. Um, so really, I just want to take this beautiful uh, <laughs> ball that you already volleyed on and volley it again. Yeah, yes. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll come back to what Patty was talking about, about this idea of opting in, um, where I, th I feel like, uh, you know, where you have a lot of agency to to opt in, you know. And as as an artist, also, I feel like you can you you're sort of already doing this, but you're you're sort of offering new possibilities for for things. Um, and so, I think about maybe thinking about new possibilities to let's say being Filipino, you know. Um, Um, well, I know, I keep, I keep, yeah, yeah. Okay. I just, um, I'll bring it to something else that you said. I don't know if you mentioned it today, but thinking about suspension. Yeah. Um, and I, I thought about suspension a lot in your work because of the water and, you know, um, and also maybe the virtual space, right, is a space of suspension. And I feel like something about the idea of suspension or even like an ambivalence in term, like can keep space open for not solidifying what those things should or should not be. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about the word that you used and, and how, you know, that's a way that I think about, you know, what this question that you have is, I don't think I have an answer really, but. Yeah, I don't know that I have an answer either. I mean, I, I I'm, but I, I really like, I like what Miljan just said about these kind of like offering new possibilities. And, and you know, I think about, I mean, it, it is really interesting. I think I'm still sort of like catching up in a certain way to the world. Like, I, I mean, I remember being a young artist and, and, and having, you know, and um, this, you know, brilliant uh, Canadian, Korean Canadian artist named Jin Mi Yoon was a professor of mine. And I remember when I was just learning that I wanted to be an artist, you know, she kind of really gave me this encouragement to feel total agency over how I, how I, how I framed, how I frame myself. Right. And, and then it's been really through teaching, right. That I sort of learned that there was this generation that was actually much more kind of interested in these kind of, in, in sort of framing themselves, right. In relationship to some sort of form of identity or, um, and I think, like, I'm really excited to see, like, young, this is not totally answering your question, but I'll, I'll just sort of bounce off of, like, something that Miljan said about this, uh, offering other possibilities. Like, I'm excited to just see uh, a, 
a new generation of artists actually have a multiplicity of options, right, to choose from, right? Like in terms of how they wish to navigate um, questions of, of, yeah, this kind of like this, this intimacy or distance from a thing, right? And, and how that can actually, uh, yeah, provide for them a lot of agency in terms of, in terms of how they choose to um, move through the world as artists in, in a certain way. But it went a little off. The yeah, but this idea but, yeah. of opting in has yeah. been really helpful for me, actually, because yeah. it was funny. We were talking about um, last year there were two gatherings of Asian Americans in the arts in Northern California that happened at the same time. One took place at Stanford and one took place at Montalvo, which is less than 10 miles away. One was for Asian American artists and one was for South Asian American artists. And the two had almost no overlap and no communication in the same week. And people kept asking me, oh, are you going, are you going to, so to Northern California for the convening? And I was like, first of all, which one? And secondly, I wasn't invited to either of them. And it was so interesting and like really uplifting. And then it was actually not true. I was invited, but they weren't gonna pay me, so I didn't go. <laughs> is that I had actually gotten so used to my expectation that I would not be invited because I don't register as the right kind of Asian American that I didn't even really think about the fact that I was choosing not to opt in. And I just want to say that the perspective that you all presented the other day when we were meeting was a really refreshing one for me personally. To, and it's got me to sort of think about like, when do I choose to be an Asian American curator and when do I not? You know, there have been certain times when I've explicitly chosen, like going to work for an Indian art gallery, and other times when most of the time in my career, I'm an art and technology curator, I'm a contemporary art curator, I do performance, I do commissions, and it just happens if you look at my roster that I'm like always repping the Asian Americans. Like, just it's just what happens, it's what I'm interested in. And, but, you know, I mean, is there, is there really any overlap in the backgrounds of the four of us? Like probably not that much, really. We didn't grow up in the same place. We didn't grow up in the same family structures. You know, we didn't quite grow up at the same time, although it was pretty close. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really interesting way to look at it, which maybe creates some different possibilities for inclusion. Jim, yeah, thank you for that. Mel John, did you want to add something? I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Um, I am curious how you think about, if you do think about, in approaching this work, about the tension between nature and identity as a intrinsic and um, sort of almost unassailable ideal versus personality and environment as more practical and negotiable in, in creating these stories where you have uh, potentially that narrative tension between the idealized and the actual. So I was going to ask this question too, but I was going to ask it as, are we Asians by nature or are we Asians by nurture? <laughs> <laughs> Simon. <laughs> I wasn't going to answer that, but maybe I will. <laughs> but I, I, I just want to say that um, by, by listening to each, uh, each one of you, all of you I love, and you know that, um, I was very taken by um, Miljan saying the word responsibility two or three times, right? And the way that, I think the way that Miljan articulated responsibility in conjunction with how Patty, I think, also talked about that, and also Vish, can answer this question, okay? So, um, Franco Fonari, a psychoanalyst, asks a question concerning war. He asks, what, what would it be like if we were to take responsibility for the unconscious? Because so much of war comes from unconscious motivations, mm -hmm. right? And so when, Miljan, you were talking about the, the landscape and like these, okay, these are the questions that 
that we are asking about, uh, you know, exhaustion, about extraction, et cetera. And Patty, when you were saying, you know, that, hey, uh, these people went into this field because they love something, but they have to, in a sense, disavow a part of, you know, their love in order to fulfill the responsibility of tracking the demise of these creatures. It made me think immediately of a sort of Lacanian paradigm of, you know, you have to be uh, faithful to your desire on some level. And maybe that is a type of fidelity to desire that is not explicit. And so also, um, Vish, when you were talking about, um, you know, the three dudes sitting around talking about women, you know, right? It, it's, you know, it's almost as if, and I kept thinking about Fonari, maybe along with Edouard Glissant, you know, and thinking about the unknown. What is the ethical? The ethical is that which you do not know. And in that sense, I think that, for me, the question is not about naturalization or identification or having things in common, but rather responsibility toward, you know, points to that which you do not know. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean if we were to take responsibility for the unconscious, for our, un, for our unconscious, mm -hmm. right? So in that sense, I think that, that pulls me into the idea of what is Asian American? Like what is, what is it that you feel that you are drawn to, that you, in a sense, don't know about the other, that you can articulate something that is different between us. So maybe I'll leave it at that. <laughs> you know, that, that in, in some ways I, I'm interested in exactly the political, ethical possibility of that unknown. Well, I think one of the things that we often struggle with and that I definitely struggled with when I was entering the curatorial field was this sort of expectation of extraction on our part, that as diaspora artists, we will go to the motherland and we will bring back some authentic story for consumption in the West. And that this all kind of fits with like an anthropological approach where you know, our naturalness also discredits us as scholars of our own experience because we're not dispassionate observers. We're considered to be too invested, which, I mean, is nonsense. Like, why would I be more invested in one place I've never been than somewhere else? You know, yes, I have ancestry there, but is that a given? So I think this question, I mean, I'm really interested in what Simon raised because well, two things. One is, you know, I'm also my, my one of my big projects right now is this PST art and science project with UCLA, Atmosphere of Sound. And my collaborator on that project, Victoria Vesna, often talks about scientific reductivism as the biggest problem in science right now, um, which I think is related to what Patty was saying, that it's so invested in its emotional neutrality and that the way that as, a, as disciplines, the scientific disciplines ensure that neutrality is to compartmentalize the subjects of study to such an extent that the different disciplines aren't talking to each other and then they're not able to adapt to a more holistic kind of worldview that whether that's a, a view of a body as a complete system instead of a series of separate parts or whether it's understanding climate and species collapse and overpopulation and war as being part of the same continuum and not you know, separate phenomena to be studied separately. So that's sort of my response to what you're saying, Simon, is like, what kind of observers are we in a sense? And I think you know, to your point, which I, I'm very interested in this, this is my own research question right now for myself is really about like this, you know, to what extent can I govern my own unconscious or at least be aware of how it motivates my actions and where does that come from and what's it reflecting and you know what are those really ugly thoughts that nobody wants to admit that they have um, but there's a certain analytic kind of approach that makes it possible to look at the most awful feelings and ideas in a way that could be constructive so I'm interested in that, right? Like in what way is being dispassionate or disinvested emotionally 
either protective for us so that we can do the work or protective for our subject of study who we might otherwise obsess over so greatly that we just simply destroy it. Yeah. Um, I think one, yeah, I mean, I like thinking about, about this issue also. I mean, there's, there's really, um, you know, for, for me, I think, um, I think it comes down to something really upstream in, in terms of the, the constitution of Western subjectivity already is uh, a, a split from, from nature, is an existential uh, imposition, you know, that it's me and the world. And I wrote this paper about just the history of the West is just doubling down on this, the, on existentiality, you know? And I think the, and so nature is always part of the unknown. And so, and the West or Western subjectivity always has this hostile relation to, to, to nature, you know, or to the unknown. And so I like to think about uh, this, this question of, of ethics when, you know, in, in, in this context, yeah. Time for one more. I have a very simple question um, about the process of making the film. It's a question for you, Vish and uh, Mel Zhang. Like how exactly you made this film. The film feels very intimate. And so I understand that it's personal to you. And at which point do you enter that narrative? And, and also, how did you collaborate between you two? And what, what you compromise or how you negotiate throughout the process? Um, I think what's what's special about it is I, I, don't, I don't go in, you know, I, I don't, um, yeah, I don't go into that material. You know, like I, 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 I talk to uh, Vish and Vikram and I hear their stories, you know, but I'm not, um, I don't, yeah, I, I didn't impose or, or um, shape what I thought it was, you know? I, I felt like my, my, my job in, the, in making the work was to uh, keep an eye on the container, you know? And so the, the film works differently for the two of us. You know, for, for me, it addressed uh, certain uh, issues and, and interests. And, and Vish, you know, experiences it differently also. Yeah, I mean, I needed to feel something in it. So I tried to figure out how I could, right? And like, I think that's when they took the shape that it was taking. Because I think I, I understood what we were doing, like philosophically and intellectually, in terms of this kind of landscape that we were constructing, that, you know, that Miljan was really like working to kind of figure out how to construct. And I just felt, I just needed to find it in some way, right? Like, and so I just started recording conversations, which is a way that I've been working more recently. And to kind of like, and then listening to them. And like, like we would meet and I would record them and we would meet with Vikram Tamboli and I would record, sometimes forget to ask permission. But um, I mean, which is terrible, it's a terrible ethic, but I, 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 we didn't use anything without asking everyone permission for everything. Um, but it's also illegal. Um, but uh, I, you know, it's just, but I, it's the way that I understand things and the way that I understand material and the way that I understand relationships. I mean, my entire practice is like filming people in my life, right? To kind of understand what my relationship to them is. And so once, once some of those relationships started to emerge, right? Which included attention even with the historian, right? And, and, it, it, and there was actually, we, we actually kind of, Got, we got locked in a sort of a thing, right? Right up until the very end and, and then resolved it really beautifully, right? Because he is not of Guyanese descent and, um, but has this deep investment in this place and in deep investment in certain narratives of the place, which 
impacted me for two years that we've been working together because I've been talking to him also about other work um, in terms of how he was narrativizing the relationship of South Asians to that place, right? And, and that, I could tell that that tension was something to explore, right? Like that that was, you know, and so in a sort of a way, the, the piece just kind of keeps zeroing in on what I felt as the drama points, yeah. right? And then, and then it was so important actually to have like Miljan as in a sense, it's like an innocent bystander that I also knew like loved me and cared about me and like cared about the investigation in many ways, right? But also, and also cared about it sort of in objective ways. And so to be able to kind of bounce between the two, like, cause I heat seek to drama. That's where like almost all my work happens, right? Like it's like, like, cause it, that's interesting to me. I'm also like, yeah, I'm a gay boy that grew up watching soap operas and television. Like, I, like drama means a lot to me, right? And like, and it's also like, it's part of the way, weird way that like queers watch groups, right? Like a gay, like a gay kid sits like absorbing all the drama of the family, right? And like heat seeking in, right? And so like, that's just like a thing that like in a way I had to find whatever, whatever those dramatic points could be and push at them so that we could find the thing. And that's how the piece got made. But, yeah. 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 but it's interesting that it comes from love. I think I really want to kind of close Absolutely. on that. Right. Well, it's Valentine's Day. So I was, I had a question similar to the question that you asked that I didn't get to. But the second part of it was to ask Patty a little bit about collaborating, because here you're collaborating with Estrita and then with Estrita's sister, right? So there's, there's the love and the intimacy between those two scientists and writer that you're working with. And then you often also collaborate with your partner, David, and you also sometimes collaborate with Leroy, your child. And so can you talk a little bit about love and collaboration to close us out? Oh gosh, yeah. Um... I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with trust and intimacy. I mean, I collaborate with these people. My piece here was a collaboration where we'd never met each other in person, but we spent like two years meeting every week online. Mm -hmm. And over time, um, we, and because we're working from some such different directions, you know, there's a certain level of trust that you know, Alexia has to have in me as like working with materials that, you know, she doesn't want to be misrepresented mm -hmm. or, you know, and also the fact that there are two sisters and me, I'm like the Miljohn in a way of that relationship. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like they're like really close, but I balance them out and, but they trust because they're together too, you know? So it's like, it's real, it was really interesting, this dynamic. And, um, but you know, like we had to, I think over time come to a level of trusting each other. And I think that that is really the key to collaborating with anyone. Yeah, so it's a form of love, right? When you trust, you Indeed. give in, you give in. Well, I love you all very much. And I've loved working with you and I hope we get to do it again. Thank you, Thank you. for having us, thanks for being here. Thank you, Anna and Anne, for curating this awesome show.